I just, uh, I'm, a, I'm a great fan of yours, Adria. So <laughs> I'm delighted to, to let people know what you've done in your life uh, thus far. And, and we really look forward to hearing what you have to share with us. So Adria Galizia was an Institute of International Law and Justice scholar from 2010 to 2013. After receiving her JD from New York University Law, NYU Law in 2013, she joined Debevoix and Plimpton in the Business Restructuring and Workout Group, where she assisted in consensual restructurings, collateral management, resolution planning, and bankruptcy-related litigation proceedings. And I'm happy to say I didn't know her in that context. <laughs> She became a corporate associate and a member of the firm's financial institutions group. She's now assistant director of community programs for the New York Center for Interpersonal, excuse me, Interpersonal Development, as well as the owner of her own business, Honestly Esquire LLC, where she provides a variety of coaching, consulting, and conflict management services to groups and individuals. Adria also serves as the clerk for the Earlham School of Religion Board of Advisors. And I'm very happy to say that's how I know Adria and how wonderful it is to work together. So I just wanna say that Adria is quite remarkable. She's got the head of a lawyer and the heart of a Quaker and putting those together in the empowered personage that she is, is just quite a treat to, uh, to listen to. And so I look forward to, to hearing what you have to share with us, Adria. You're a very powerful and thoughtful leader within the Society of Friends, and we're really very grateful. So, Adria. So you would think that after, gosh, three years of doing this, I would know exactly where the button was to unmute my Zoom. And yet here we are. Um, thank you so much, Gretchen, for that uh, introduction. And thank you, um, Brown, for the invitation to participate in this series. Um, it has been uh, a journey as I listened to Gretchen's bio and I, Gretchen sharing my bio um, and thinking about how I have come to this moment. And that is definitely something for further reflection. I'll be sharing tonight on the theme of becoming people of the promise. And I, even coming to the lecture that I'm going to share was a journey because as I told Brown <laughs> when I shared the theme with him, I don't know anything about what I'm going to say. I told him this past fall, but I, but this is the theme and uh, that status of, I, this is the theme. This feels right. This feels what God is leading me to share, but I don't know what it means. Um, continued until I think roughly two weeks ago. So uh, I am hopeful and prayerful that this is the message that I am called to share at this time. Um, but I ask for your prayers this evening as, as I share this message with you um, and your grace if I have, if I'm stumbling over something, um, because as is so often the case, uh, I got a Holy Spirit download right in the nick of time. Um, so let's get started. I'm going to start by, by reading um, the passage that the theme comes from. I didn't know this passage was where the theme was coming from. Literally, the phrase came to me, but I Googled it, and this is what I came up with. It's from Ephesians 2, 12 to Ephesians 3, 6. Therefore, remember that formerly you who are Gentiles by birth and called uncircumcised by those who call themselves 
the circumcision, which is done in the body by human hands. Remember that at that time you were separate from Christ, excluded from citizenship in Israel and foreigners to the covenants of the promise. Without hope and without God in the world, but now in Christ Jesus, you who were once far away have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who has made the two groups one and has destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility, by setting aside in his flesh the law with its commands and regulations. His purpose was to create in himself one new humanity out of the two thus making peace, and in one body to reconcile both of them to God through the cross, by which he put to death their hostility. He came and preached peace to you who were far away and peace to those who were near. For through him, we have both access to the Father we both have access to the Father by one spirit. Consequently, you are no longer foreigners and strangers, but fellow citizens with God's people and also members of his household, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, with Christ Jesus himself as the chief cornerstone. In him, the whole building is joined together and rises to become a holy temple in the Lord. And in him, you too are being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by his spirit. For this reason, I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ Jesus, for the sake of you Gentiles, surely you have heard about the administration of God's grace that was given to me for you. That is the mystery made known to me by revelation, as I have already written briefly. In reading this, then, you will be able to understand my insight into the mystery of Christ, which was not made known to people in other generations as it has now been revealed by the Spirit to God's holy apostles and prophets. This mystery is that through the gospel, the Gentiles are heirs together with Israel, members together of one body, and sharers together in the promise in Christ Jesus. For thousands of years, Israel was a people set apart. In some nations, you could eat any food you could catch. But in Israel, the dietary rules reflected not only notions of cleanliness, but also of decency. No cooking a calf in its mother's milk. No dismembering a living animal to keep its meat fresh. A lack of refrigeration could not be an excuse for cruelty. In some nations, the law was whatever the king said it was, but not in Israel. In Israel, the leadership might change. The people might be led by a prophet like Moses or by a judge like Deborah or by a king like Solomon. But the law came from God, separate and apart from whoever happened to rule. Even a king might be approved, might be reproved or corrected or chastised, as David was by the prophet Nathan when he betrayed his general Uriah. In some nations, the people worshiped gods of gold or stone or wood. They fashioned idols with their hands and imbued them with a power they did not possess. But Israel worshiped the living God, whose likeness could not be captured in an image or a statue, whose power was ignored only at great peril. While other gods were silent or distant, Israel's God led his people directly a pillar of fire at the head of the column, a dove upon the shoulder, a still small voice. Israel's God was intimate and demanding and jealous of his people. But he was faithful to them as well, even when they were not faithful to him. So we have here a small group of people 
who had the privilege of being God's chosen people. They enjoyed the intimacy of the covenant of knowing their God was faithful and true. They had been led by the power and presence of God, by the elemental fury of divine wind and fire. By contrast, the Gentiles, though much more numerous, were, to quote the passage, excluded from the covenant and without hope. They didn't know God's law, his call to purity and justice and holiness. They didn't know the God of Israel, worshiping figures of wood and stone instead of the spirit which must be worshiped in spirit and in truth. Israel was set apart from such as these by the strictures of law and custom. They could not marry or even socialize with the nations, those outside of Israel. But Christ destroyed the dividing wall of hostility, creating peace between Jews and Gentiles by making one people out of two. Through the cross, the enmity between Jew and Gentile was put to death. He brought peace to those who were far from God and peace to those who were near. Through Christ, both Jew and Gentile might be welcomed into the household of the Most High. Joined together to build a holy temple in the Lord with Christ as the cornerstone. Both dwelling places for the Spirit, heirs together, members of one body, and shares together in the promise of Christ Jesus. The promise of Christ Jesus. What is this promise? What is the joy to which we are called? When the fire of the spirit descends on our lives, purifying our ways and burning up that which is not eternal, the promise is what remains. It is the fullness of the kingdom of heaven, which extends into eternity. The promise of Christ transforms our lives first as individuals. We've probably all seen that poster at sporting events, right? John 3.16 in the big block letters. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For many Christians, this is the entirety of the gospel. This is the promise. That death is not the end. That our lives are not limited to mortal bodies, which are easily broken easily killed. But the promise of Christ is bigger than that. Another part of the promise is shared in the book of Acts. Through Christ, everyone who believes is set free from every sin, a justification nobody could obtain under the law of Moses. We are forgiven for our offenses against God's holiness. We are forgiven for the ways we degrade each other and ourselves. We are forgiven for our lies and our selfishness and our domination of others. A note on this forgiveness. Sometimes in our speech to one another, someone will apologize and we will reply with something along the lines of, it's okay or no big deal. And sometimes this is a gesture of grace and graciousness on our part, but sometimes it's a way of expressing that what the person did, the cause of the apology, is simply not that important. It's not a bother. It's not worth worrying about. This kind of forgiveness is not the way that God forgives. The fact of the matter is God's justice is absolute and his holiness is complete. To defile ourselves or each other by failing to honor our God-given dignity is not a matter of little consequence, a mere personal matter of taste. It's something very serious. To speak falsely or to let our tongues run away from us in gossip or wrath is not a harmless foible or a quirk of personality, but a grave sin worthy of grave punishment. Christ himself said that whoever calls his brother a fool is in danger of hellfire. Friends, I may be alone in this, but I've certainly called people far worse than fools more often than once. But even though our sin cannot be denied or hand waved away, God's forgiveness is greater than our wickedness. This too is part of the promise. 
And speaking of wickedness, part of the promise that we have in Christ is that wickedness will no longer have the last word. In Christ, our nature is changed. Our inclinations are changed, renewed, and transformed. And instead of hearts that tend towards evil, we will discover new yearning for goodness and righteousness in the promise. Through Christ, we are given the power to see that righteousness through into reality. We are no longer slaves to sin, but beloved sons and daughters of the Most High. And like all children, we resemble our Father. When we are in the promise, God's justice, love, truth, wisdom, mercy, purity, and dynamic creativity will be in evidence among us. Healing is also part of the promise. We don't talk about it much as modern, quote, rational people, but the whole New Testament is full of miracles of healing in body and in spirit. People with leprosy, the man born blind, the woman whose body wouldn't stop bleeding, people possessed by spirits or touched by disease. The overcoming of illness and affliction is part of the promise as well. So this is the promise for every believer, right? Eternal life, forgiveness from sin, and healing from afflictions. I mean, that's a pretty big deal. But friends, that's actually just a tiny fraction of the wholeness that we are invited to in Christ. Because you see, the promise also restructures how we approach our family. Part of living in the promise is caring for our families. Jesus has nothing but contempt for the Pharisees who justified their neglect of their parents by saying that anything they would have given them was korban, that is dedicated to God. What a cop out. Part of the promise of faithfulness is being the type of people who do right by our families and care for them materially. But before we take Christ to be promoting an obvious family values agenda, it's worth noting another thing that we're promised if we surrender to God, and that is strife within our households. For Christ said, do not suppose I have come to bring peace to earth. I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. For I have come to turn a man against his father, a daughter against her mother, a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. A man's enemies will be the members of his own household. Anyone who loves their father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. Anyone who loves their son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. So one aspect of the promise is that family loyalty is subordinated to faithfulness to God. We are going to be tempted to be a good brother or a good sister, a good mother or a good father at the expense of our discipleship. But sharing in Christ's promise means that loyalty to his call must come first. For people who are living in the promise, children are precious. Not a burden or an inconvenience, not solely a pleasure or used to, for the benefit of adults. Instead, they are cherished and owed a wholesome upbringing. In his preaching, Jesus invited the little children to come to him for a blessing, demonstrating that spiritual nurture wasn't just the province of well-educated, well-regulated adults, but also for the youngest and least sophisticated members of the community. But Jesus wasn't just offering hugs and kind words to the youngsters. He had very stern things to say to the adults of the community, such as that whoever caused a child to sin would be better off being drowned in the ocean. Raising up children to righteousness is a mark of life in the promise. But as transformative as the promise is for us as individuals and as remarkable and life-changing as it can be for us in our families, it is downright revolutionary for how we relate to our communities. One aspect of the promise is love and connection for all. And all really means all. All includes people from groups that our culture might see not just as different, but as degraded. When Jesus, a Jew, was speaking with the Samaritan woman at the well, he wasn't just speaking with someone from a different ethnic background. He was speaking with someone from the group that Jews saw as mongrelized and degenerate, a people who had abandoned the path of purity and holiness and betrayed the traditional worship of their fathers. Not only was their faith 
perverted, but their very blood was contaminated in the Jewish view. Jews did not interact with Samaritans, but Christ did. All means all. All also means people who hurt us personally. Jesus knew that Peter would deny him and that Judas would betray him. And yet he stayed in relationship with them as a testament to the extravagant love of God. All means people whose lives are marred by their own bad, even wicked decisions. Situations like that of the woman caught in adultery were clear examples of the uprightness of the law in the face of the degradation of the flesh. As hard as it may be for us to step into that ancient worldview, the folks who were prepared to stone the woman were attempting to uphold the purity of their people and their righteousness before God. It was in harshly sanctioning immorality that Jews demonstrated their commitment to God, their faithfulness to the law. The marriage bed must remain undefiled among a holy people. And Jesus did not condone or excuse the woman's betrayal of her covenant. What he did was encourage self-reflection and humility on, on the part of those who would have stoned her and repentance for her. To them, he asked, who has fully carried out the strictures of the law? Of course, the answer was no one. To the woman, he said, go forth and sin no more. He didn't wink and nod at her sin, but commanded her to change. He invited the self-righteous into mercy and the unrighteous into transformation. No one was beyond the reach of his care. This too is part of the promise. One aspect of the promise is forgiveness. And we've already talked about how God forgives us for our sins, but in the promise, we must also forgive each other. On the cross, Jesus forgave those who had killed him. And when he was asked how many times we should forgive each other, he answered 70 times seven. That's a lot of forgiveness. But part of the promise is maintaining an open heart and constantly being willing to set aside the wrongs we have suffered. But another hugely significant aspect of the promise is repentance and restitution. In a way, this is the flip side of forgiveness. Yes, those who are in the promise must be ready to put aside the wrongs that have been done to them. But those who are in the promise will also be convicted of their own wrongdoing and eager to make it right. You cannot live in the promise and keep doing the same old evil things in the same old evil way. So when the tax collector Zacchaeus' heart was pierced by the preaching of Jesus, the authenticity of his conversion was evident in his changed behavior. Tax collectors in that day were government agents, but of a particular type, because even though they worked to carry out Rome's tax law, it was common knowledge that they took more than the law required and used that money to line their own pockets. They were one part IRS agent, one part gangster, and they preyed on their own people. When Zacchaeus committed his life to following Christ, therefore, he did two things to address the reality of his ill-gotten wealth. He gave half of his property to the poor, and to anyone he had taken advantage of, he promised to pay them back fourfold. He wasn't just going to return to them what he had taken, but he was imposing on himself what I as a lawyer might think of as punitive damages. So conscious was he of the fact that he could not enjoy the freedom Christ promised while burdened with stolen riches. He wasn't just sorry for what he did. He committed to changing his life and to making things right with those he had taken advantage of. When we enter life in Christ, we don't start with a clean slate. We don't just say, well, today is the first day of the rest of my life. If our conversion is real, we'll want to go back and fix the places we've messed up. Because making things right is part of the promise. The promise of Christ is marked by generosity so extreme and countercultural that the rest of the world finds it shocking. Those who are in the promise and have wealth freely dispose of it to help those in their community who are in need. Hoarding, holding on to wealth is anathema. Like the Israelites gathering manna in the desert, people of the promise know that hoarded riches will spoil. Instead, they ask, What do I need to live? 
Anything above that is turned over to the community for the use of the community and for the doing of good works. So we know in the book of Acts that people who had properties and houses sold them so that the needs of the poor, both within the Christian community and outside of it, could be met. You couldn't find a person going hungry in a place where the church was established because caring for the material needs of others was so fundamental to believers' spiritual DNA. Open-hearted generosity is part of the promise. But again, there was a flip side. This giving was freely done and was a sign of God's transformative work in one's spirit, not a requirement for participation in the community. Faking that transformation, pretending to that new life in the spirit crosses a red line. And so one part of the promise is judgment for those who would claim a level of transformation that they have not yet experienced. Nobody forced Ananias and Sapphira to sell their property and then turn around and act like they were turning over all of the proceeds to the community. Nobody told them that they couldn't keep any for themselves. But when they pretended to be more giving than they were, when they acted as though they had turned everything over to God, but they were really hoarding some for their personal use, divine judgment was swift, sure, and deadly. God will not be mocked. In the promise, dignity and access to the transforming power of the spirit are such a high priority. Jesus spoke to, taught, and was friends with women as well as men. He healed Gentiles as well as Jews. And when he met a man who was unable to walk, who could not get himself to the pool of Bethesda, where the ill and afflicted gathered to be made well, Jesus met him where he was and offered him healing. Life in the promise has no tolerance for society's distinctions around who is worth dealing with and who isn't. And when someone in need isn't coming to the place of healing, people of the promise don't just stand around and wait. People of the promise meet them where they are. Finally, one key aspect of life in the promise of Christ is that at every turn, people are invited into new life, warned to leave their sinful ways behind, and encouraged to put their faith in God. If new life isn't being offered, we are not in the promise. If transformation isn't anticipated, we are not in the promise. If we are not teaching and expecting righteousness, repentance, restitution, mercy, forgiveness, care for our families but refusing to make idols of them, thoughtful dedication to the spiritual nurture and protection of children, putting our wealth on the altar, meeting the needs of the poor, bringing healing to those who need it, and most of all, unshakable faith in the Lord. We are not in the promise. So often we phrase salvation in profoundly individualistic terms. We fixate on that John 316 language, which is so precious to our faith, that God loved the world, that he gave his son, that those who believe in him should have everlasting life. That aspect of the promise, as I said before, is so real and so true. And yet in our consumeristic and individualistic age, it can represent a temptation for the body of Christ. It encourages us to see our life in Christ in individualistic terms, even transactional terms. It sounds like one of those hot deals on Groupon, believe in Jesus, get everlasting life. And it's a good trade, especially since it seems to demand so little of us in exchange for so much. And yet we can see that the kingdom of heaven, the promise that we partake of in Christ is profoundly social. It's profoundly relational. Yes, it depends on individual change and transformation. We do become new creations when we are in Christ Jesus. But that new nature manifests itself through a revolution in our ways of relating to our wealth, to our families, to those who share our faith, and to the hierarchies and divisions that structure our society. The promise that we are invited into is so broad and so deep and so multifaceted, and it obviously has many implications for different aspects of our life. We're gathered here tonight in Black History Month to reflect on how the promise affects a specific aspect of our life together. 
And so I'm going to spend the rest of this time wondering how sharing in the promise, sharing fully in the promise might transform our approach as friends to issues of race and racial justice. So the first question we have to ask ourselves is, what has been friends approach to racial issues thus far? Um, there's a part of me that wishes now that I had, now that I know what I'm talking about, that wishes that I were going after Vanessa, who's speaking next week. Um, but drat, you'll have to just go and rewatch this um, to hear probably a more fulsome historical overview. But most of us gathered here this evening, I imagine, are aware that friends in North America have, in the United States of America, have too often rejected Christ's invitation into a new way of living, at least as far as racial justice is concerned. Friends held slaves for a hundred years in the United States and deluded themselves that they could do so in all love and charity, consistent with their testimony to the work of the spirit. Yes, there were prophetic voices that said otherwise, and yet there was no consensus until the um, mid 18th century. When friends finally came to the realization that they could not hold slaves consistent with their faith and they ultimately manumitted those they had held in bondage. Many friends became philanthropic collaborators in building up black institutions such as schools and churches conscientiously contributing to the well-being of Black people they did not know and would never meet. I have a personal connection to one such institution, Bettis Academy in Trenton, South Carolina. My family and others benefited from the donations of friends from New York Yearly Meeting, which is my yearly meeting, actually, to build up a learning community that was able to share knowledge and generate economic opportunity and support a deep Christian faith. Folks at Bettis Academy partook in a rich environment that educated them in teaching and the trades at a level far beyond the standards of others in the area, whether black or white. The rich legacy lives on today in the disproportionate number of black college graduates and professionals in their 60s and 70s and their children and grandchildren who have benefited from opportunities previous generations who tended that sandy soil could not have imagined. On that little strip off of Highway 25, there is a love of learning and a sense of community that is unique in the area. Friends contributed to that legacy. But it's telling that while friends encouraged and supported the efforts of newly freed Black people, for example, in creating congregations of their own, they discouraged or outright refused membership to those very same people when they wanted to join the Religious Society of Friends. Black people worshiping and marrying as wards of meetings was laudable. Black people worshiping and marrying as members of meetings was often unacceptable. Friends were happy to manage the spiritual development of Black people, but not to encounter them as equals. Friends were willing to go the first mile, Christian charity. But they never went the second mile, to solidarity. And the reality is, in many ways, friends still haven't gone that second mile. The promise that we share in Christ is that the dividing walls will fall, that, that even opposing sides will become one body, one holy temple in which the spirit will dwell. But white friends historically and sometimes even today have insisted on maintaining a barrier of separation that follows the color line. White friends are often happy to support people of color for example, in some of our friends' organizations, we seem to we prioritize ethnic diversity, even as our commitment to fully inhabiting our Quaker faith in those organizations is sometimes less solid. But when it comes to walking alongside people of color, 
welcoming and welcoming them into friends meetings, choosing them as neighbors, ministering to them and being ministered to them with the same love, vulnerability and intentionality that Paul showed the Gentiles. In my experience and the experience of many friends of color, we often fall short. Even the story of how slavery was finally ended among friends in the United States shows how deeply the self-concept of many American friends is connected to whiteness. The killing blow dealt to slavery among friends wasn't a sudden realization of the obvious fact that there is no loving, God-honoring way to treat a human being like livestock. Instead of being the fruit of recognition of the moral worth and dignity of Black people, Slavery's death knell among friends was the realization of the pernicious impact of slaveholding on white friends, a reaction to that unfettered power over others, which fosters an attitude of selfishness and the gratification of base appetites rather than self-control and dignity. In other words, 18th century friends changed their approach to slavery in large part because slavery hurt them, not because it hurt their slaves. They desired to embrace more fully an identity as the harmless and innocent people of God. Their question was not about whether the practice violated the spirit of the promise, again, with notable, notable exceptions, friends had, who had been working for decades for change. But that question of whether they were violating the spirit of the promise was secondary. Instead, the question a larger question was whether the practice would leave them defiled. And that's an important question, by the way. I don't intend to minimize it. Most of us never get that far to really considering how actions that our surrounding world finds normal can turn us away from the path of righteousness and then finding the strength to forsake those actions. My son is addicted to these uh, uh, the series of children's books called I Survived. And it's basically, you know, a, an eight to 12 year old kid going through some kind of disaster. I survived the shark attacks of 1916, or I survived the San Francisco earthquake, or I survived the Great Chicago Fire. So they have an I Survived the Battle of Gettysburg, and the protagonist is a, a, a 12 year old boy, a slave who's escaped with his little sister. And I found out listening to that book, listening to the author's note, that a strong boy uh, cost more than a house in those days. A strong male slave cost more than a house in those days. So sometimes friends say things like, well, you know, early, you know, friends in the 18th century freed their slaves, but what else did they do? And it, I have never given away a house because owning it was uh, inhibiting my walk with God. So I could never disparage the conviction of people willing to sacrifice a legal right because of how it impacted their relationship with God. I know how it feels to say no to wealth and yes to faithfulness, and it is a very big deal. But as we've already discussed, cleanness, innocence, and freedom from sin constitute just one part of the promise and perhaps the most self-interested one. And I fear that much of the discourse around racial justice among white friends that I've heard is stuck sometimes in an individualistic paradigm, whether they frame it this way or not. The question becomes, how can we be free of the stain of white supremacy? How can we stand blameless before the Lord? And it's an important question, just as the question of the morality of slaveholding was an important question 250 years ago for our spiritual forebears. But it's a question that leaves intact the conception of we and us as white people. It places friends in the immutable category of guilty beneficiaries of a white supremacist culture, a definitional choice that preserves the dynamic of Vanessa's book, Fit for Freedom, Not for Friendship of reforming the way that we relate to them, but not transforming our vision to see that in Christ, us and them become insignificant categories. 
they're not erased, but their importance becomes so small in the face of the unity that we know in Christ. What matters most is how we come together as one body, as building blocks stacked next to each other and on top of each other, mingled together as a living temple inhabited by the living God. In Christ, we are one body. So as long as the word friends is, is understood within our religious society as representing middle-class whiteness, rather than a body of believers living in harmony across racial, political, and social boundaries, we cannot become people of the promise because we are still trying to maintain the dividing walls and barriers that Christ has torn down. With that in mind and holding the reality in our hearts that Quakers in the United States of America are in fact disproportionately um, white people. And interestingly enough, according to people who collect statistics on such things, we're also the most highly educated religious group in America. What would it look like to fully partake in the promise as friends? Well, on an individual level, embracing the problem embracing the promise, excuse me, looks like liberation from the chains of the past. Christ has already won the victory over sin and defilement, putting holiness and wholeness in their place. We must stand ready to liberate others and invite them into new life as we have been invited into new life, not with the cheap grace of suppressing the racial wounds of the past, or the false innocence of those who would not see the ways they have benefited from and been complicit in racially unjust systems and ways of being. No, our freedom must first pass through an acknowledgement in our very souls of the injustices done by us and our people and to us and our people. We must grieve for the part we have had to play in the racial caste system. Then we must seek guidance from the spirit on how to move forward in the joy and confidence that comes with the knowledge that Christ has set us free of these ancestral curses. Not that we forget them, not that it's erased, but that it's no longer a wound that is raw and bleeding or a chain that binds us to a past we can't move on from. Who the son sets free is free indeed. If we are not free, we are not in the promise. But part of being free is learning a new way of being in the world, and that means giving up some of the wicked little pleasures of racial separation. For example, those conversations that white people have with other white people when there are no people of color present, or uh, where sometimes the conversation comes up about the problems with this group or that group, except, of course, for the good ones. Or the subtle ways that sometimes people of color challenge each other to gain, gain credibility based on how hostile they're willing to be toward white people. The particulars vary, but you probably know whether you have participated in conversations and situations that dishonor Christ's reconciling power. Which is not to say that we can kumbaya our way past racism or injustice. We need to recognize it in ourselves and in each other, and it needs to be resolved. But we can recognize that our brethren need healing from the sin of separation, or even that they must be restrained from their course of action without compromising our faithfulness by indulging in contempt. Another way of leaning into the promise is to embrace the freedom we have to recognize Actually, before I say that, I just wanna be 100% clear and um, transparent. The only way I know about the conversations that white people have with other white people is because white people tell me. So I'm not saying that you personally have those conversations, but I'm saying those conversations take place and you've probably overheard them or they've happened. And if, in, if you're not involved in them, it's because people know that you're not down with that but they do happen. And the same on the other side. I've overheard conversations and be part of conversations where I've had to tell people in my own family, like, I can't, I can't do this. Like, you can't, you can't do this. I'm Christian or what? Like, we can't do this. So again, 
we have to be real with ourselves and with each other about sometimes leaning into that sword that Christ brings where we say, you know, there is going to be some strife because I can't indulge in those conversations that maybe I did in the past because that's not the reality of the promise that I'm living into. Another way of leaning into the promise is to embrace the freedom that we have to recognize how our lives are marked by sinful patterns and to choose another way of being. Just because you learned growing up that you as a person of color should defer to white people doesn't mean you have to keep doing that. Sometimes it might be safer to do so. Sometimes it might be expedient to do so. But you get to decide that because no matter what the world says, your worth and dignity is already fully established in Christ. Or just because you learned along the way to judge people's clothing and speech and lifestyles based on how close they are to your own or how close they are to an ideal imposed by a white elite. It doesn't mean you have to keep doing that. We need to be aware of how we import the world's values into our homes, our social lives, and our meetings and churches. If the warmth of our welcome or the tenderness of our caring depends on somebody's conformity to idealized cultural norms, we are not in the promise. Another thing the promise might look like is repentance and restitution. Let's think back to Zacchaeus, the tax collector. He was a parasite who had robbed his brothers. And when he heard Jesus preaching, his heart was pierced with conviction. Hearts are being pierced today as well around questions of race. Written in verbal confessions of white supremacy, newly created norms of addressing um, racist speech and behavior. These are challenging our view of ourselves, our traditional approach to eldering, and our very self-concept as friends, sometimes for better, sometimes for worse. I want to be clear. A heart that grieves for wrongdoing is a sign of the Spirit's action inside of us, that grief is holy and good. But Zacchaeus didn't rent his garments or smear himself with ashes when he heard the preaching of Jesus. He didn't wail and he didn't fast. Instead, he opened up his wallet and started writing checks, Figuratively speaking, of course. First, to give away half of his ill-gotten wealth to the poor. And second, to make whole anybody he had cheated or taken advantage of, not just paying them back, but again, giving them that fourfold payment for what he had taken. Zacchaeus didn't lobby Caesar to reform the way taxes were collected. He didn't dwell on his shame or complicity in an unjust system, though, of course, the system was unjust. Though he was convicted by the spirit in his heart, his focus wasn't primarily on his guilt or on himself at all. After all, his guilt, real though it was, was taken care of by God's infinite forgiveness. Instead of pinning his focus on himself, Zacchaeus was concerned with making things right, giving back what he had taken with interest and moving forward. I compare that to what too often happens in my experience among friends. Recently in one of our yearly meetings, a letter was published lifting up with prophetic insight, various pathologies in the body, conflict aversion, the dynamics of carrying ministry when one's paid employment is among friends, the challenges of helper helpy dynamics among others. The letter's author ascribed these pathologies to the yearly meetings culture of white supremacy. Listening sessions were held in which the question of whether the yearly meeting was adequately confronting its white supremacy became a key issue. Feelings were hurt and tears were shed as friends either felt hurt that others were not acknowledging their inherent racism as white people, or they felt hurt that others were saying that they were inherently racist because they were white people. I don't know the extent to which white supremacy culture explains the various challenges that that yearly meeting faces. But I understand from those who participated, from several of those who participated, excuse me, that instead of focusing on the specific challenges that had been lifted up and how to make them right, the focus of the conversation was largely on how guilty friends should or shouldn't feel. And perhaps because of that focus, there was little time or energy to listen to how God might be calling friends forward into wholeness, forward into care, forward into faith 
forward into renewal. So for white friends, I ask, where is your focus? Do you believe that you're forgiven? Do you trust that you've been redeemed? And are you ready to make things right? Or are you so caught up in the conversation about just how bad you should feel that there's no space to change anything concrete? The promise looks like fellowship, an invitation for all kinds of people. One of the truly pernicious effects of the systematic and racialized oppression of social groups in the United States is that race and class are so tightly intertwined that while our mental image of a poor person may not be black, our mental image of a black person is likely to be poor. And how could it be otherwise in a country where wealth in the form of labor was systematically extracted from black communities for centuries with literally nothing given in exchange, followed by a century in which wealth continued to be extracted for a pittance, followed now by many years of disinvestment in the very cities where so many black people had gone for opportunity. So in these United States, black people are more likely to be poor, more likely to struggle, less likely to have accumulated family wealth to cushion the blows of life's vicissitudes. Black people are less likely to have college degrees. And if we do, we are less likely, less able to parlay those degrees into lucrative careers. Black men are more likely to go to prison Black women are less likely to marry, less likely to end unexpected pregnancies, more likely to divorce. Putting the picture together, Black people are more likely to have problems of the kind that a lot of nice middle-class white people, such as most American friends, would prefer to avoid. So why do I bring all of this up? And just to be clear, obviously the 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 racial landscape in the United States is much more complicated than black and white, but those are the two extremes of the continuum. So that's why I'm, I'm using them. That and my own personal knowledge and experience makes me feel more confident to talk about my own community. I bring all of this up because one of our struggles as friends, separate and apart from any question of race, is that we are deeply ambivalent in many cases about sharing our faith. For a long time, I thought that this ambivalence was primarily driven by distaste for some of the more aggressive flavors of evangelicalism, which sometimes give the impression that they're the only imaginable connection one might have with God. Or perhaps I thought it was a conviction that God was already at work, a respect for the spirituality and sacredness of the journey of the other, and that all we needed to do was to live our lives in a decent way and be open and be faithful. And those who God intended to find our meetings and churches would do so. But the more I reflect and the more I think about the stories that I've heard over the years, the more I wonder if part of our hesitation to invite people into our meetings is a fear that they would actually come. And that would mean that we couldn't control our meeting ecosystems and we couldn't maintain the comfort and the camaraderie that we feel. We couldn't ensure that the people who came would be the right kind of people, our kind of people. I've actually seen meetings grow, gain new members and new attenders only to alienate them with eye rolling and other rude and dismissive responses when they gave ministry that was a little different in tone or reflected a different life experience due to differences in race, class, or ethnicity. I'm not talking about acting or speaking in bad order, but of showing up in a way that didn't appeal to everyone's taste. I'm not talking about substance. I'm talking about aesthetics. Some of us would rather see our meetings die than trust God to work in the hearts of those we don't deem sufficiently Quakerly. If, God forbid, we started welcoming historically oppressed minorities into our meetings and into our churches, they might be people with problems, people we don't know how to manage, people whose mucky, complicated lives we might be pulled into. They might start asking us for things, help babysitting their children or paying their rent. They might want help finishing a job, or finishing school or finding a job. And then where would we be? I wonder if the fact that so many of our meetings and churches 
are located in proximity to communities of color, which may or may not be struggling. And yet, even though we often lament our lack of diversity, we also often make absolutely no effort to minister to those communities, to serve them out of the pure and righteous love of God, to meet them where they are and to invite them to encounter the spirit in a new and different way. Again, maybe that's partly cultural sensitivity, not wanting to colonize the worship of people of color. And I'm certainly not advocating hustling people into windowless vans as they enter the local AME church or iglesia. But I do have to wonder if sometimes we don't engage with people of color because we just don't want to associate with them. They aren't our kind of people and they might have needs. And then what would we do? Of course, life in the promise answers that question too. Just as there is invitation for all kinds of people in the promise, those with wealth share from it freely with those without. Though people who are living in the promise know that human beings are made to be loved and material things are made to be used, not vice versa. And so wealth is a means to an end, a way to demonstrate the love of God. In Mary's song of praise, she said that God will fill up the hungry with good things and the rich he will send away empty. In the promise, believers consider this declaration not with fear and trepidation, but with a cheerful declaration that there's no time like the present, as the wealthy empty themselves of their riches in order to eradicate poverty from their midst. This doesn't mean living off of bread crusts and potato peels necessarily, but it does mean thinking carefully about what you actually need and what is a luxury and being generous with those who are struggling to make ends meet, a group that will disproportionately include people of color. Note, by the way, that this sharing of wealth is not individual, but corporate. If you sell your house alone, you won't have a house and there's no guarantee that you'll have a community around you to care for you. But when we've discerned together and come together in one mind, in one spirit, when we've gathered in one accord, we can decide how best to use our shared resources, not so that we all sink down, but so that we can lift others up. That commitment to God and to each other is what enables us to live into our calling to be the active and faithful body of Christ, not just a collection of individual cells. This is the point in the talk where I do my own confession. Sharing money has never been easy for me. I internalize lessons around frugality and thrift very early. I tend to be a saver occasionally to my own detriment as I have a hard time throwing away that last corner of the ketchup bottle or the stained garment that's almost still wearable. Every time I walk down the laundry aisle at the grocery store, the writ clothing dye stares down at me, shaming me for not redying those dingy t-shirts in the bag in my closet. But even with that, it's hard to give. So I'm not in a position to cast any stones. But what I can say is this, I took a huge pay cut when I transitioned from a large law firm into the practice of mediation, about 75%. I was following God's call to use my legal training to bring people together. Only after taking that pay cut did I realize how much more generous I could have been when I was bringing in a really nice income. I was afraid to give, afraid to give up a certain bank balance, and I felt like there wasn't a community commitment to giving, that I would be doing it on my own. So instead of really using my money to make a difference, I held on to resources that could have made a huge difference in the life of someone earning a modest income. That fear, that anxiety about not having enough is a good indication that we're either not committed enough to each other and each other's material well-being, or we don't believe that God is committed to us and to our well-being. If we're living in the promise together, we can afford to share, secure in the faith that God will provide. We can take money from our own resources and put it in the hands of the real live people in our community who need it. But what we might say about the children, parents with a measure of privilege often make choices for the sake of their children that they might never make on their own behalf. The choice to move out of a certain neighborhood or send their child to a private school or fill the child's weekends with extracurricular activities 
that crowd out Christian fellowship and opportunities for service. Again, I'm just as, this is me. So this isn't casting stones. But parents who leave a diverse city for a quiet suburb might say, it's not that I'm racist, it's just that I want the best for my child. And of course, wanting the best for your child isn't racist. But are you living in the promise? Or are you making a choice that leaves other children worse off so that your child can be better off? It's a genuine question. I don't know the answer to it. But it feels important because while children being nurtured and cared for is a fruit of the promise, it is equally part of life in the promise that our obligations to our families can never be used as an excuse for not following the will of God. And what does it mean to do the best for our children? Does it mean sending them to the most prestigious schools? Or does it mean raising them in an environment where they get to see God's love and power at work in the testimony of our lives together? We need to come together in our meetings and churches and understand where God is leading because right now, the constant anxiety about securing our children's future in an environment where we really don't have community support is driving parents to the brink. And when we're anxious and afraid, it's hard to have faith in God. And when it's hard to have faith in God, it's hard to live into the promise. Specifically, again, in a context where race and class are so intertwined, we may speak a good game, we might talk a good game about the importance of diversity and the importance of equity in education. But often, too often, when the rubber meets the road, those commitments fall by the wayside. People of the promise are people of peace, a willingness to labor with each other and to give one another the benefit of the doubt and to forgive one another. These are hallmarks of the promise and its impact on our life together. Is that what we see in our communities around issues of racial justice? Sometimes it is. But far too often, instead, we see accusations of bad faith by friends who think that Matthew 18 is outmoded and that white supremacy is the explanation for all of our problems. Or alternatively, there are friends who don't understand why we spend time talking about racism. Many of these friends are blind to the experience of people of color and the challenges of integrating into largely white congregations that may not even be sure they want you there. Friends, this strife is not of God. When we embrace the promise, we embrace the reality that Christ works in the heart of people who disagree with us, just as he does work in the hearts of people who agree with us. When we are in the promise, we recognize that those who share our perspectives are made in God's image, and those who do not share our perspectives are also made in God's image. We don't have to rig Quaker process to get our desired result. When we are in the promise, we trust that the Lord will bring us into one mind and one accord if we yield our own will and seek his. Any way of thinking or being that doesn't bring us closer to each other, but brings us further apart, that doesn't multiply our love for each other, but diminishes it, that doesn't expand our capacity for grief and tenderness and forgiveness, but makes us hard-hearted and stiff-necked. That way of thinking and being is not of God, and it is a hindrance to our life in Christ. In the promise, our outward actions are the fruit of Christ's inward transformation. To claim a greater transformation than we have, in fact experienced, is a grave sin. Think back to Ananias and Sapphira who sold their house and pretended to give all of the proceeds to the church, but were secretly holding back some of their earnings for their personal use. Nobody told Ananias and Sapphira that they had to sell their property. Nobody told them they had to give all of the proceeds to the church. But by pretending to give everything to the church and holding back, they were looking to get the social benefits of having gone the distance for Christ without actually doing so. It was a type of stolen valor, you might say, except instead of exaggerating their military service, they were embellishing their service in the army of the Lamb. And each one of them was struck dead for their hypocrisy. I worry about that sometimes, friends. I worry that sometimes 
I personally am encouraged in Quaker community to create to claim a greater transformation than I have a right to. I stopped doing the land acknowledgements a while ago that some Quaker groups favor because it doesn't feel like something that I can do with integrity. I know that great wrongs have been done in our country by pushing out and poisoning our native people. But if I say that I'm living in the land of the Lenape, but I refuse to make any effort to restore the Lenape to their land, which to be quite honest and transparent, I have no intention of doing at this stage. I worked hard and saved to buy my condo and I'm still waiting on 40 acres and a mule myself. Well, what does it mean to make the land acknowledgement? Does it mean that I'm sad? Does it mean that I'm sorry? A guilty feeling without restitution is not part of the promise. And so I wonder sometimes whether there's a clarity, at least for me, about the purpose of acknowledging the wrong if there's no feeling or plan to address it or even ask how it might be addressed in a serious way, in a way that is gonna require sacrifice. Sometimes I wonder if the purpose is more about letting other friends know that I know that a wrong was done and that I feel appropriately somber about it. I wonder if the performance, if the point sometimes is performance rather than making things right. I wonder that and I tremble thinking of Ananias and Sapphira. To perform socially without being transformed spiritually is a dangerous game. And so anytime we create a situation where there's a pressure to go along, to get along, I become afraid. Are we ready to be transformed? Are we ready to make things right? Or do we have a shared agreement about the right words and gestures? The things that nod to the spiritual reality, but don't embrace the cost of change. God is not mocked, you reap what you sow. I'm not quite sure sometimes what we sow with such gestures, and I'm afraid of what we will reap. In the promise, access and dignity are paramount. The spirit is available for all to experience. And if someone can't make it to the place of healing, we meet that person where they are. Are our meetings and churches accessible to people of color? Ask yourself where they're located, what the transportation situation is for the disadvantaged communities nearby, and that, that'll vary from place to place. Now, let's ask ourselves this. Do our meetings and churches make themselves visible to communities of color in the vicinity? Do we work with those in the community? Do we listen to their needs and ask how our congregations can serve? Do we create a space for fellowship so that when we invite people of color into our meeting houses, they aren't entering a space full of strangers. And we are inviting people of color into our meeting houses, right? Or are we? And when they come to our meetings, do we expect them to look and talk and dress just like white people with a tan? Do we expect them to participate, but only in what we're already doing and in the ways we're already doing it? Or are we open to our not only influencing them, but in their influencing us. Because again, us and them are insignificant categories in the face of the magnitude of the promise that we share in Christ. Whether it's educational background, professional orientation, skin color, or even spiritual gifting, we oftentimes don't know how to receive people who don't remind us of ourselves. The more they differ from the median member of our church or meeting, the less we know what to do with them. But the reality is we don't have to do anything with them, but preach the gospel, get to know them, listen, and love them as well as we can. And speaking of the gospel and the promise, we preach the good news without ceasing, 
inviting people to turn away from sin and towards God, encouraging each other to continually return to the source for refreshment and renewal and new eyes to see this world in which we live. If we ever cease preaching that we are called to a righteousness that exceeds that of the Pharisees, if we ever cease preaching the sacredness and seriousness of our covenants, if we ever cease preaching the invitation into new life and the forgiveness of sin, if we ever cease preaching the reality of the indwelling Christ who leads and guides us, if we ever cease preaching the goodness of creation and our responsibility to love and care for the creatures and habitats of this earth, if we ever cease walking on the path of peace, we are no longer living in the power of the promise. So what would it look like to become people of the promise? Where our meetings and churches contain individuals who have benefited unfairly and materially from injustice, the promise looks like generous sharing with those whose oppression has subsidized ease. Where our meetings are in proximity to communities of color that may be staggering under the weight of layers of oppression and disadvantage, the promise looks like intentional efforts to understand the needs of the community from the perspective of those within it, the commitment to minister to those needs and the fortitude to willingly take on the costs associated and the discomfort of being outsiders while creating opportunities for fellowship and collaboration on a ground of equality and solidarity rather than retaining the distance and superiority of mere charity. The promise looks like showing up to community events that are hosted by people of color and hosting community events that friends invite people of color to show up to. And when those people of color do show up to friends meetings, living in the promise means not expecting them to adopt the cultural norms that may be common to those in our meeting. For example, we don't show anger or we don't talk about money in order to enjoy affection and respect and belonging among us. The promise of Christ did not turn Jews into Gentiles or Gentiles into Jews. How much less could the promise of Christ insist that one must be culturally compatible with the members of a meeting to encounter the spirit and be transformed? For truly God is no respecter of persons, but in every nation, whoever fears him and works righteousness is accepted by him. In the promise, we won't wait around for people of color to show up to our meetings, but we will invite them and we will love on them in concrete ways according to our needs as we will for everyone. We won't worry about whether someone with fewer resources is coming to our meeting to take advantage, but we'll thank God for the opportunity to serve his precious sons and daughters and invite them into transformation and membership and equality in our community. We won't be sucked into the false dichotomies of the ongoing culture war within the church, which promotes the lie that we must either be welcoming or holy, righteous or merciful, peaceable or strong. We are called to be all of those things, and anyone who says otherwise is repeating a lie from the pit. In the promise, we will hold each other's stories tenderly, understanding that we cannot walk in each other's shoes, but committing to love each other and bear each other's burdens on this journey we all share. In the promise, there is room for healing and for forgiveness. How do we embrace the promise? It's important to address that because while what I've said, much of what I've said is simple, it's not easy. The transformational power of the promise we share in Christ is not something we can achieve by striving in our own power, but by resting in the power of the spirit. So what does that look like? It looks like a lot of prayer, both as individuals and as families. It looks like discernment of, as worshiping bodies, but perhaps more than anything, it looks like holding our own views lightly, holding what God has given us lightly, holding our perspectives lightly, and submitting it all to the law of love. Much of what I've said can only happen in community. So we have to ask ourselves, what's our, what's our commitment to ministry? Are we consciously welcoming, I'm sorry, what's our commitment to ministry within our community? What is our shared commitment, our corporate commitment to being welcoming of people with different cultural backgrounds and experiences? What is our commitment to providing practical help to those who wanna worship with us and be part of our community and are struggling just to live? Uh, another fair question is, what's our commitment to the people who are already in our community who are just struggling to live? 
Should we be selling property to serve the needy among us? These are questions that can't be answered on an individual level. They can only be answered by friends coming together. The only thing that can give us the courage to not try to keep all of our resources for ourselves and our own families, especially now when the economy and the world seem so uncertain, the only thing that can give us that strength is God. So if we don't trust each other enough to sit and worship together and discern together and find a way forward together under the guidance of the spirit, there's no point even trying to do this work. It cannot be done. We need to listen to the different gifts that God has given to our communities. I feel like I, you know, I'm a broken record because I keep coming back to spiritual gifts. But Ephesians 4 lays out, the, four, lays out five essential gifts that all of our communities need. We need the apostolic gift, which is about starting new ministries, the prophetic gift, which is about understanding God's will and seeing the gap between how we are called to do things and how we're actually doing them. We need the evangelistic gift, which is all about making our faith accessible and inviting those who have not yet embraced it to come, taste and see that the Lord is good. The shepherding gift, which is all about making those within our communities experience the love and acceptance of God through our fellowship together. And the teaching gift, which is about expounding on our doctrine in ways that help people better understand the spiritual and practical truths of this world that God has made. Among unprogrammed friends, really the shepherding gift and occasionally the prophetic gifts are the only ones I've seen consistently supported. Uh, I imagine that among programmed friends, the teaching gift may also be supported. But that still leaves out the apostolic, prophetic, and evangelistic gifts. And those are the gifts that we're going to need to grow community in a new way and create new communities and new contexts. These ministers, the apostolic, prophetic, and evangelistic ones, they're the ones who cause all the trouble by telling us what we're doing wrong and what we need to change and how things need to be done differently. But they're the ones who we need to be listening to very, very carefully in the context of becoming the people that God calls us to be, becoming a people who welcome all of the beautiful diversity of humanity and welcome people well and authentically and love people well and authentically. We also need people who are gifted in cross-cultural communication, sometimes called the missionary gift. All of these gifts are so important, but if we continue to marginalize the apostolic, prophetic, and evangelistic gifts in our post-Christian era, when most of the people that we're talking to either have a limited understanding of Christianity or an actively hostile view towards it, we'll pay for it in this time more than we might have a century ago when we could have been carried along by inertia. I feel a little embarrassed giving this talk because what I have shared seems to me both so wacky and unattainable and at the same time such utterly basic New Testament reading. So I feel embarrassed two times, um, maybe three times since I'm talking to an audience of people who actually like know what they're talking about with degrees and everything. But friends, it seems to me that if our spiritual ancestors could start a 400 year movement with the simple goal of just being authentically Christian, that we might be able to do amazing and transformative things by attempting the same. Thank you. Thank you so much, Andrea. Amen. So this is the part where I say, you can't tar and feather me because we're doing this via Zoom. So if everyone hated it, I'll just log off and never see any of you again. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I'm going to ask that we, Keep our comments and questions brief. Um, if I think there's about fifty or so of us on this call, so let's let's keep our comments and 
questions as brief as we can. And we're gonna use the raise hand uh, button so that I can follow you. So if you have a question, please raise your hand and I will ask you to unmute and then we will move from there. Go ahead, David. Adria, I do not think it would be immodest if you would point people to some of your written testimony, the articles you've had in Friends Journal and perhaps elsewhere. I, I find it very useful to go back and look at those. Sure. Um, so I had an article in 2019 called Greater, Theo greater Racial Diversity Requires Greater Theological Diversity in Friends Journal. Um, this year was a big writing year. Uh, I did a reflection on the peace testimony, I think in August and um, a piece called Facing Evil, Finding Freedom on the Atonement in December. Um, I have a blog called In the Shadow of Babylon, uh, <laughs> shadowofbabylon.com. Um, and, uh, and I also have some things on some, uh, I gave a talk at for Pendle Hill on spiritual gifts, which I felt said everything that I wanted to say on that topic, which was a, a blessed opportunity. So those might be good starting points. And, and thank you, David. Diane? So first of all, thank you. And if we're not jumping up with questions, it's partly that we're just still absorbing all of the things you've said. Um, and it's really given me a lot to think about. So, but, so Mike, I'm just gonna ask if you could expand a little bit because I'm not as familiar with these being a um, more silent worship Quaker on apostolic evangelist, evangelistic and prophetic gifts and how that might look among Quakers who probably aren't, as comfortable with them and some branches anyhow. Yeah, no, absolutely. So um, so if you look at Ephesians 4, there are five gifts that are mentioned for the kind of for the building up of the church. And they're the apostolic gift, which is starting new ministries to in the response in response to the needs of the moment. So we actually do see some of that uh, if you've ever been visited by Emily Province. That's definitely someone with an apostolic gift. She supports germinating ministries, nascent ministries, um, and is very thoughtful about uh, creating structures that are going to be sustainable um, so that so that the spirit can blossom and flourish. So that's an apostolic gift among unprogrammed friends. Um, an evangelistic gift, uh, I think, oftentimes look like people with a gift of welcome. So there's the, they're the people who kind of have never met a stranger. When they have a passion for our faith and are able to kind of take, uh, make it accessible, um, that would be an exercise oftentimes of the uh, evangelistic gift. They're the people who, uh, you know, are out there making like YouTube videos on Quakerism, um, you know, Quaker speak, I think, came in part out of an evangelistic impulse. How do we make our faith accessible to people who might not find it otherwise? So that's an example. Um, is that helpful? Yes. <laughs> great, great, great. And it's so it's so hard. It's funny because I've been told by different friends that I have aspects of them um, prophetic and also evangelistic but that event like I love talking about God I love talking about friends I love talking about Jesus but it feels so rude and like socially inappropriate and so it's always hard to to break through that because I'm culturally conditioned so even if you have a gifting it doesn't necessarily make it easy it just means that you feel really awkward about it and you can't help yourself <laughs> 
Thank you, Alan. Yes, um, Adria, this is Helene Pollock in Philadelphia. <clears throat> I see um, ad hoc gathering of random people for lots of nurturing activities. Number one being the daily worship at Pendle Hill, other worship experiences that are possible by Zoom, some of which I participate in, small groups like with Rex Ambler's experiment with light, extended worship, uh, open worships that people can attend um, all over, for, sponsored by many yearly meetings and many monthly meetings. And I'm wondering if you see the seeds of renewal in these gatherings where like-minded people feel at peace with each other, talking about the very same things that you are talking about, when it is much more difficult to raise these topics for many of us in our meetings. Is it just me believing that God is working through small groups now, or do you also observe that or believe that or hope that? I am so hopeful. And also, can I say, Helene, ooh, it's been a minute and it's such a blessing to see your face. It has been a while. Um, it has been a while, but uh, yes, I, I think much, I think particularly in the kingdom of heaven, and I'm thinking about, you know, that little mustard seed that goes into the dirt or the, you know, or the seed that is the word of God that goes into the dirt. And when a seed goes into the dirt, it starts off by being hidden and it starts off by being small, but there's a lot of work happening in, in those seeds. There's a lot of action and there's a lot of life in those seeds. And, and, and then that, you know, that plant starts to grow and it's just a little green shoot and you might walk past it and not even see it. And it grows day by day, such a little bit, such a little bit, such a little bit, and you can't even see the progress. But if you go away and then you come back, you might be surprised that that seed that was almost too small to see has grown up into a tall and strong plant. And so I see that there are many seeds that are planted, that are growing, that are springing forth. I think we're at a point, and I've had this conversation with several people who are here this evening, where a lot of us are throwing caution to the wind because we recognize like if we don't do it now, it's not going to happen. There's no point trying to steward our social capital and stuff like that. It's like, no, you got, you, you either have to do it or it's not going to happen. Even for the religious society of friends, like we have to do it friends. We have to do it like now. And so I think that those small groups where people can gather, where people can get encouragement, fellowship, deepen their faith, study the Bible together, think about, think together about uh, what's possible and encourage each other to actually take those steps and support each other in, in, in ways both material and spiritual are an amazing source of possibility for what God is doing in this moment and what is going to happen next. Go ahead, Gretchen. Thank you, Adria. Wow, it's amazing. I, I've taken so many notes, I began to write sideways. But um, yeah, thank you so much. And, uh, you know, I remember one time working with a meeting uh, that was struggling to grow and just tell asking them, what's the good news you have to share? What is it when somebody comes through your door? What's the good news? And they really struggled with that. And I think many friends meetings do. How do we, how do we find language to, and how do we ask each other, you know, what is it for you? What, what is it? How do you experience God? What, what happened for you in meeting today? You know, um, how do we open each other up to those kinds of conversations? Oh my gosh, Gretchen. <laughs> yeah, well, listen, if I had a great answer, uh, I would have already done it every place. 
<laughs> I would have already told everyone, but I think that there are a few things. Um, so I think there are a few dynamics going on that are mutually reinforcing and all very challenging. I think one is an honest and genuine honor that we have for every individual's spiritual journey. And because we honor that journey, we don't want to constrain it. And we don't want to say, well, like, that's not what we're doing here. So, you know, get out or whatever. And so I think that there's a fear sometimes that, that by coming up with a shared vision, discerning a shared vision, that you're going to, that's drawing a circle and there's always somebody outside of a circle. The flip side of that is if you have a knitting club, it's fine if people crochet and it's fine if people do uh, do uh, needlepoint, but if they want to skeet shoot, it's going to be a problem. And so how do, so, so we actually do need to have a shared sense of what we're doing in order to be able to do it. And people who say, well, you know, but I, you know, I want to do my thing individually. It's like, well, if you want to do your thing individually and I want to be gathered in a body of believers, we actually can't do that in the same space because then we're just individuals together. Like somebody's going to be losing out. So I think that's part of it. But, but, uh, but I think understanding that need for like a shared vision, which can be expansive, it can be open. It doesn't have to be exclusionary for goodness sake. I think the other aspect though, is like you said, opening, opening people up, it's hard. We do not have practice. I think among, um, particularly among unprogrammed friends, I can't speak to program friends about, we don't have a lot of practice making our testimony. I was at my uncle's watch night service. My uncle's a pastor, Baptist pastor in South Carolina. I was at the watch night service and the first 30 minutes of the service was just people testifying to how God had been good to them over the past year. And watch night is a new year's Eve service. And I would, and, and, you know, the mic was going around. I put my hand up for the mic and I, and I gave my testimony and it was, it was so like weird because there's, there's not a context for it. There's not a container for it among friends that I've seen, but it was so good. And I think that if we got in the habit of asking that question, how is truth prospering with you, friend? How is the Lord moving in your life? That's how is the spirit flowing? at this time, I think it'd be a good, I think it'd be a good thing. And I think it would make all of the other things easier. I think it'd make all the things easier because it's so much easier to testify from our own experience than to make a broad sweeping statement and have to worry, well, is that true for you? No, but I can say what's true for me. So thank you for that question. <laughs> um, Roja? Yeah, um, I, I just was uh, reflecting, and one last thing that you mentioned recent, uh, just uh, 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 one of the very last things that you mentioned really uh, struck me uh, um, deeply, and that is to testify from one's own experience. I think that's a beautiful phrase, uh, and I'm thinking of working from the outside in instead of, I mean, all, all of what you said makes an awful lot of sense and resonates. And I thank you for that. But I was thinking that these are theoretical underpinnings for what our actual experiential uh, uh, um, activity. Uh, to, uh, in other words, if we reach out and we show by how we live, uh, I'm thinking of people where it has worked for us. Like I came from another religion, a totally different religion, not even Christian. And I was enveloped with love and caring and understanding by someone, an elderly uh, person who ex experientially showed the nurturing and the embracing and the mentoring. And these are experiences that spoke more so than anything theoretical. Or, And if we can capture that in a, in a kind of a bowl, a crystal ball, and, and, and uh, I use th those experiences and those ways of being in other words, how you live and how you express those beliefs and feelings can be so uh, uh, effective. And, and to, to uh, kind of look at how that 
those experiences can come about by people that have gifts for that. These experientially loving and caring and nurturing, uh, these things draw people in and, and make it so real that uh, by doing rather than explaining or uh, uh, is such an effective way of, of inviting people and making them part of our group. Uh, just thought of what, what you think about that. Well, I mean, you can see I'm all lit up. Um, I, uh, when I first started attending Friends Meeting, it was at St. Louis Friends Meeting. And I, I always say that because I just, everyone should know St. Louis Friends Meeting is wonderful. I was a, a college student. I did not have a car. Public transit in St. Louis is it almost feels like a cruel joke. Um, and so someone came and picked me up and dropped me off to meeting every week. Someone, when there was an event at the meeting house, someone came to campus and picked me up and dropped me off. I never felt pressured to bring something to potluck. It was always appreciated if I did, but what they gave me was time because it took time. People had to make time to do that. And they had to make space to do that. And it wasn't the same people every time but there was always somebody. Fast forward, I came back East. I'm from the East Coast, but I came back East for law school, spent two years going to different meetings. It was so hard to find that kind of community because people on the East Coast culturally, right, are overscheduled, like it's a different culture and people don't have the time, but that time is a sacrifice that is a necessary input for that like, experiential love and it turns out that if we carve out time for each other and we have an intention to be present to one another the love starts to flow and now you know at the meeting where I am which has changed pre-covid post-covid I've been there for 10 years but right now we're at a beautiful moment where like basically have to kick us out after you know we're just lingering in the fellowship room for like hours um which is, which is, which is great. So part of it is the gifts, but part of it is also making the commitment that, no, this is worth my time. You're muted. Oh, I said Ben, Ben, go ahead. Sorry. Thank you. There's so many wonderful things that you've said tonight that um, I didn't know where to start, but where I was touched most personally was when you were talking about wealth and giving that which is over what you really need away. And <clears throat> that's um, pertinent to me and to other people, I'm sure. Um, giving sums of money away or in a way that does more good than harm is sometimes difficult to discern. And I'm curious what you think about, well, in the Ananias and Sapphira story, the money was given to the elders to distribute. Um, how, what role do you think our meetings have in taking our individual wealth and distributing it appropriately? I think that's a fantastic question. Okay, so the first thing is, and this goes back to what Gretchen said, right? We actually have to be in a place where we trust each other spiritually. We have to trust each other's discernment because if I'm gonna give you a big old check, it's really important that I trust you to do that discernment so that that money goes to the right place. I do think, that our meetings have a role. Sorry, my I got a lot going on. So one of the challenges that we face, right, is that we're all individual. We're human beings who come from different cultures. We're human beings who come from different cultures. In the meetings where I've been a part of, there's been a really strong culture around taboo about money, and specifically around taboo about financial need. So I remember standing in there and saying, you know, oh, friends should do more with finance, personal finance. We should have workshops so that people have ideas about how to like use their money well, how to steward it, how to invest, da, 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 da. Friends stood in front of me and said, oh, we don't need that. Quakers don't need that. We're all good. I'm like, I'm physically looking at four people who have either filed for bankruptcy or were considering file for bankruptcy in that moment. And I'm like, 
are you kidding me? But I knew that because I was close to those individuals and they felt comfortable sharing to, to me. It was not common knowledge that they were in financial straits. And so until we have a sense where we feel like we could be safe being honest, listen, my ex-husband left our family almost exactly four years ago. And I tell this story because I will keep telling the story because it's so paradigmatic. Left our country, our, my marriage four years ago. I had quit my job to follow him. I had a son who was two at the time. So there I am unemployed with a toddler, abandoned. People in my meeting like, oh my gosh, this is terrible. I'll be holding you in a light. You know, just let me know if you want to talk. All of that was great. That was spiritual support. I knew I was in their thoughts and prayers. But nobody in my meeting asked me, like, do you need money? Now, Quaker, now friends of mine and friends of Jesus Fellowship, where we had that intimacy, we knew each other, road trip together, prayed for each other, laid hands on each other, prayed for each other's healings. They said, you want me to pass the hat? And eventually, even though I did, you know, just kept badgering me until I said, yes, you can give me money. But like, it was startling to me that even in an obvious situation where, oh yeah, you, you have needs, right? A mother of a small child whose husband has left and who doesn't have a job, like, I don't know how much else it takes. And I'm, you know, to the extent of like historical oppression, I'm also black. So it's like, if, if we don't need, like, I was ticking boxes left and right as some, far as somebody who like somebody maybe should have asked do you need some money? But we don't have a culture of it. So what does it look like to create a culture where we feel responsible to each other? It requires being willing to lay down the mask of self-sufficiency, which is also part of the culture, that like I can do it on my own. And if I can't do it on my own, there's something wrong with me. So now I'm ashamed. That's got to go. We have to trust each other spiritually. We have to trust each other's discernment. So we have to have a spiritual intimacy because that, you know, I don't ask you and you don't ask me because your story might not be my story. That's got to go. And then we actually have to be willing and feel like we're accountable to our meeting for our use of our resources, that there is a right way and a wrong way to use our money. And, you know, unfortunately, I think a lot of people really like friends is like, well, nobody tells me what to do. <laughs> and it's like, well, if you come in with you're not the boss of me, then how am I going to, if I come in with a you're not the boss of me attitude, how am I going to react when you say like, no, we have to be responsible to each other so that we can take care of each other. Who are you to tell me that I have to give you money? You know what I mean? Like, that's not what I came here for. And so that's when we come circle all the way back around to what are we here for? And making God's love manifest in our communities actually requires us to uh, have some skin in the game. And so I do think there's a role. I do think it could be very powerful as far as not being theoretical, as I think it was Roger, not being theoretical, but being really like practical as far as our showing our love for each other. But we have to be intentional about breaking down the barriers to that kind of intimacy and accountability and sharing if we want to get to that point. Wendy. Brown. Adria. <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness, my heart is just beating Adria. This was so magnificent. Um, so um, my question um, is really kind of a follow up to the last question, um, which is about the time to be tender, uh, which was your, your presentation and in, in testimonies to mercy. Um, I, um, I'm just having flashbacks of talking to you on the phone while I walked around the lake right now, all our conversations about class and corporate discernment. But anyway, um, so I love Adria. Um, but, um, That's out of the bag. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, you know, 
I'm interested in hearing your thoughts um, again in, in my case, but you know, I think for many of the people here, maybe for the first time, about how corporately we can make the time to know each other intimately. Um, I know that many of us think about, you know, having the time uh, to know each other is our is our personal responsibility. That you know, maybe we should have a a discipline around sabbatical, for in, for instance. But there are real economic concerns that people have that require them to work a lot now in our economy. And so, what do you see? as the connection between our corporate discernment and our intimacy and how we can um, build together the time to have the intimacy for us to share these, um, these needs and feelings with each other. That's all. Oh, is that, oh, is that all, Wendy? Oh, That's is that all? all. <laughs> um, that is a tremendous question. So these are problems. So, so life is full of trade-offs, right? And so we have this trade-off between my individual autonomy, my freedom to do what I want, and my uh, and the 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 richness and nurture that I can get from community. And it's not always obvious when we are making certain decisions that we are trading things off. So for example, where my mom lives, when she was a child, right? It was like hardcore blue laws. If you, you were not getting a gallon of milk on a Sunday before noon, because why? Because before noon, you were supposed to have your behind at church. So they had made a decision as a county that they were not going to be engaged in commerce on Sunday morning. That was time for worship. So when I was at the firm, and I've relaxed on this discipline to some degree, but I had that similar discipline when I was in law school as well. I said, this is not going to get easier. This is only going to get harder. I'm not working Sundays. That was hard. I had the flexibility to do it, even though I was the only Christian at my firm who observed the Lord's Day, because there were a ton of Orthodox Jews who did. And I guess it would have been, you know, I would have called the press if they had told me that I couldn't. But it was interesting to be the only Christian in an office that had a lot of Christians who were, who were not, who were, who were uh, working seven days a week. And so, so partly there are some things we can do individually. We can say, we can make that commitment, things I'm not gonna do on Sunday or things I'm not gonna do the first weekend of the month. I'm gonna take that as retreat time. Or I'm gonna take that as time to visit people in my meeting. I'm gonna take that as time to pray with my family. I'm gonna take that for whatever recharging activities. There's some things we can do together. But now you've asked that question about corporate discernment. And so if I have, if I've committed to not booking up my Sunday, but everybody else in my meeting is booked, then that time is not useful for building up the building up of the body. It's useful for my personal growth and deepening, but it's not useful for the building up of the body. So it would be useful to have or good to have some shared discernment about what our commitment is to each other as far as time. Now, of course, it's a vicious cycle, right? Because people are less willing to engage in discernment or less effective at engaging in discernment when they don't know and trust each other. And so one thing that I've seen in different yearly meetings is that people try to short circuit, and you and I have talked about this, short circuit the discernment process. So, oh, we'll have a committee do that and we'll present a report and we'll ask for reactions, but the report is already written. Or we'll let the clerk of the yearly meeting do that. Or we'll let the GenSec do that. We're not going to actually trust because we don't trust each other. And of course, we can't trust each other without the time. So I think actually having those conversations explicitly, you know, actually saying, can we have a called meeting for worship or can we tack this on or can we do a second hour at our meeting? where we talk about the time that we spend together and what does it mean to be in community together? I think if people go into it with a level of seriousness, it could be helpful, but, and I won't say, but, and 
it's a hard thing to invite people to reflect on where their actual priorities are. Because one thing I found, and I'll shut up Brown, because Brown was like, you know, he, well, he, he asked you to keep your questions brief. He didn't say anything about my answers. Um, <laughs> but, uh, but I did youth ministry for a year. My last year at the firm, I was doing youth ministry. I was meeting with a group of young people at five different monthly meetings. So I was like, we don't have critical mass for teenagers at our monthly meetings. So I met with kids from five different monthly meetings. And once a month, we would gather at the diner and we would eat waffles or whatever. And I would ask people, how's this spirit moving in your life right now? And that was the extent of spiritual content, but that we would respond to that question and eat breakfast and it was great. And then the other thing we would do is we would, we would have one meeting a month at one of those five meetings where we would have like some kind of content. We talk about the history of the peace testimony, or we talk about early friends, or we talk about whatever. And what I found, because when I was launching the group, everybody loved it. The parents loved it. Oh my gosh, this is great. We don't have to go all the way up to the retreat center. Oh my gosh, my child is yearning for Quaker community. Oh my gosh, there's other teens. This is wonderful. This is amazing. But when it came time to meet, oh, robotics club, oh, marching band. Oh, soccer. Well, I can't care about your child's spiritual formation more than you do. Because you're their parent. So if you don't care about it, if you're not willing to prioritize it, like, I can't help you. I can put out the water. But, you know, if the horse isn't drinking, you just shove its head in the bucket. That's animal abuse. So I'm not going to do all that. And so the question then becomes, it's holding up the mirror and saying, you have said that you are hungry. You have said that you have a desire. You have said we have a need. When it's presented to you, when it's offered to you, you don't want it. That's okay. You're allowed not to want it. But understand that what you're saying is robotics club, which your kid is probably not going to be doing that for the rest of their life. You're going to be doing that for two years. So for that, for so you are sacrificing on some degree their walk with God from now until you put them in the ground and beyond into eternity for some robotics club that at three years out of high school, they're not even going to remember the name of their advisor. Like we can all, we all have freedom. We have free will. We can make our own decisions, but I don't think people realize necessarily they're not thinking through the trade-offs in the moment when they're saying we can't come because of robotics club. Well, it's like, what's, if that's one week, that's one week. But if you can never come, then what you're saying is your spiritual life is worth less than having this club on your college application or whatever the case may be, which is, by the way, a very understandable fear. And I'm not throwing casting stones because, you know, my son's six and he's in a swim club and scouts and all this stuff. Like, so I'm, so I get the anxiety. We got it. You got to be well-rounded. You got to be marketable. You got to be this. You got to be that. Because otherwise you might wind up in the gutter. But if we had stronger communities, we wouldn't have to worry about that so much because we would know that there was a safety net. So again, we trade off like this maximum freedom for minimum security. And we don't even realize that we're doing it. I had opinions about that, it turns out. I didn't, <laughs> I didn't realize. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Adria. I'm gonna invite uh, Della. Is Della on the call? I'm gonna invite Della for some few uh, remarks and then I'll have Gretchen uh, give us some concluding remarks and that'll be it for the night. Thank you, friends. Go ahead, Della. Greetings, friends. I'm Della Stanley Green, for those of you that don't know me, and I'm the director of the brand new Quaker Leadership Center there at ESR. And um, I want to invite all of you to come to a Zoom session um, on March 16th, where we will have a particular focus on talking about this whole Wilson uh, series of Wilson lectures and the implications for our meetings. It will be very focused on leaders in friends meetings. Other folks are perfectly welcome to join, but, but that will be the focus. So. Uh, we look forward to seeing you then, and please keep your eye on our website, which we do have a website. Um, I'll put it in the chat, and uh, because there's some upcoming opportunities for us to be having some really important conversations together, and hope that you will 
be able to participate in those. It will be in person in Richmond, so I know that not everybody will be able to participate, but I hope you will uh, consider that. So that's all I have to say. Thank you, Brown, for giving me time. Of course. And before I bring in Gretchen, I just wanted to share that this is a series that is going on. The next one is uh, February the 20th, led by Vanessa July. Please watch out, look out for my email. And as always, it gladdens my heart to see as many of you here. Gretchen? Well, I just want to thank you again, Brown. Thank you, Adria. Wow, you've given us so much to think about. And what a blessing it is that ESR can, can have this kind of conversation. And there's, uh, there's so much that we carry and love to share with each other. And it's very, very rich. And so thank you all for coming and being with us. Um, would it be okay if I just close with some prayer? Okay, let us pray. Oh, gracious God, you are so generous. The richness of our lives, of our relationships is indeed a blessing. And we are reminded that these blessings come from you, oh God. Be with us as we think on these things and share them with others. Be with us as we worship you. Be with us as we live into your love. For all this and so much more, we say thank you and thank you and thank you. Amen. Go well, everyone. Thanks for joining us. Thank you.